Paxton Aronson currently plays for the Philadelphia Union in MLS and is one of the rising prospects of U.S. soccer, just helping recently the U.S. men's national team U-20s qualify to the U-20 World Cup and the Olympics. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo, and welcome to Tactical Manager TV, and welcome to another exclusive interview today with Paxton Aronson for the second time. Yes, we've had him here in the channel roughly a year and a half ago or so, and he was actually the first player we ever had, and today... We're going to have him back. We're going to talk about U.S. Men's National Team U-20s, player development, his relationship with his brother, Brendan Aronson, that now plays for Leeds United, and much more. Don't forget to smash the like button before we start. Comment down below other players you want us to have here in the channel, and much more. All right? So sit back, relax, and let's bring in Paxton Aronson. All right, everyone, today we have for the first time here in the channel, not the first time that Paxton is here, for the first time we have a player that comes to the channel for the second time. So Paxton, thank you for dealing with me twice in the matter of less than two years, something like that. How are you doing? Yeah, good. How are you? Uh, thank you for having me on. I mean, the first time was fun, so I'm glad to be back. So let me say, let me tell you one thing before we start, something you might not know, I, I don't, or you don't remember this. Um, so... I don't know how much you've been following us and seen how much we've grown the past year or so, but you were the first player to ever come here in the channel. Did you know that? I I think I do remember you saying that from the first interview. So yeah, that was a huge honor. And I have seen how much you've grown. It's It's been great to watch and happy for you. And the main reason I'm saying this too is because uh, on behalf of myself and Dustin, that's the channel producer, we wanted to thank you because... One thing many people might not understand was that really opened a lot of doors for us, right? Because once you have one player, other players will be more comfortable coming along, right? They've seen, okay, the interview went fine. There was nothing wrong, controversial. And I believe right after it, your brother came to the channel right after. So both of you opened a lot of doors for us because after both of you were there, a lot of players started to come along. So I wanted to start this interview saying thank you to you and to Brendan too, but more specifically you, because you were the first one to trust us. And oh, well, thank you. Thank you for trusting me to be the first one on. Yeah, and you are slowly living up to the expectations we had there. But with, with that said, it, this one's about you. So let's talk about you real quick. U.S. Men's National Team U-20 cycle. You've been part of pretty much this entire cycle from the day one that Coach Vadas took over in the Revelations Cup. The first thing I wanted to ask you was this. During the the Revelations Cup last year, that was in uh, October or November, the first time you were all together, uh, just being honest with you, the team looked a little disjointed, right? The first time. Uh, Brazil game was a struggle. Colombia game was a grind. And then Mexico, we lost. But now we turn into this. We didn't see you guys training on this mid-time. But then we come to the CONCACAF U20 Championship. And the entire team just killed it. You guys made it look much easier than any of us could have expected. What happened in terms of the preparation? What changed from the first time you got together and this time? What did you at least notice? Yeah, I think uh, you said it. I don't think you were being harsh at all. That Revelations Cup was a challenge for me and the entire team. And I think the entire staff, we were kind of thrown right into it. And uh, Coach Mikey talked about that, like during this whole qualifiers, you know, seeing the progress you made from the very start getting thrashed by Brazil and then having a tough game against Colombia and then losing against Mexico and then, okay, comparing ourselves to the top nations in the world and then taking steps by steps, you know, having camps and IMG, getting friendlies against MLS opponents and then buying into what Mikey was preaching from the very start. Even when we were losing, everyone bought into his ideas, which I think was really crucial. And I think they did a great job in such a short amount of time of getting the players, getting the right group of players buying into the team, buying into how Mikey wanted to play. And I think it ultimately played a huge role in us qualifying and us having a really, really good tournament. So you, uh, I've heard this from more than one player. We had Antonio Carrera, the goal, the backup yeah. goalkeeper of Brady. And he even talked about how, how Mikey did a great job of getting the group together, getting each player's confidence up. So 
obviously you're not going to come here and criticize the coach, but you would say you would agree with that, that coach Vadas did a fantastic. I thought he did based on what I was seeing from outside. No. Yeah. Fantastic. Like fantastic job. Like I can't give him enough praise of mm -hmm. how good he was with handling each and every player and how personal and each friendship and each bond he created with every player. And, you know, that's, that's a coach you want to play for, you know, that's a coach that you'd go out into the field and give everything for. So I think that really came into display. I know that Coach Vadas for sure has been communicating with Greg Berhalter. They help each other and work together. Has Greg ever been with you all? Did Greg ever come to camp or any time been in touch with the players, Berhalter? Yeah, he was actually there for our game against Canada. He flew in and he watched the game against Canada only for one day. I'm sure he's a busy man. So he yeah. came for that day, you know, introduced himself. I mean, he doesn't really need an introduction, but... He gave the group words of wisdom for the Canada game. He just said he was really excited to go watch us play. And yeah, it was awesome seeing him there. Yeah, because I've been very harsh with Greg in many aspects of it, but I've always complimented and seen players compliment the fact that he, he does do his job in terms of communicating and trying to stay with most players in touch and being involved, right? And I, I actually think I understand that he can't stay there for the entire tournament. Otherwise, he would just be the coach for you guys. <laughs> But it was good to see that he showed up and supported the team and was around yeah, exactly. to see what was happening. Now, going forward, you guys had games, like you said, with MLS clubs. You guys played against, was it against Argentina or was it against River Plate or both? Both, both. Yeah, we did go uh, down to Argentina and play Argentina and River Plate. So those competitive matches definitely helped. And that brings me to another topic in this same spectrum here. Uh, I always say this, that the U-20 World Cup, the Olympics, all these tournaments are so important for young players because you're getting used to playing in a competitive environment, tough opponents like you saw against Argentina. You think that was crucial for the change that we saw from that camp? Another just playing tough opponents after tough opponents, best academies in the world. Yeah, yeah, no. My, I think the team and the staff did a good job of not you know, sugarcoating it. We wanted to play against the top teams and... You're only going to get better playing against top players, top opponents, and going to Argentina, playing against Argentina, playing against one of the top clubs in Argentina with the top of academy. It only made us better and only showed us where our progress was at, what we needed to improve on. And yeah. That's something you told me about a year ago, too, when you were in the interview. You even talked about how for Philly, when you were playing the Philly Academy, you played against Palmeiras and other yeah, Brazilian Brazil, teams. Yeah, Brazil, yeah. You talked about how that was important, how you saw the level of some players and how you wanted to work on this and that into your game. And uh, we talked about that, too. Now, for the tournament, you played. Was it all the games that you played as a center forward? False nine center? Was it all? Pretty much all of them, right? Uh, every game I started false nine. I got subbed in against uh, Nicaragua, I think, at the eight. Mm -hmm. So but mostly every start was, yeah, false nine. So is that a position in or role that you enjoy playing do you think it best suits your ability or is it something more that this team needed you to do for them and your role what do you, where do you see yourself playing i think it was a little of both coming into the tournament um we didn't really have a set in stone nine so coaches were discussing and they were telling me before like we're gonna try you here like we see certain abilities that you possess that i think would work in our system work in our team really well as a false nine we think you have a good ability to check in to pockets, you know, good half turns and then being like a killer in the box. So I was all for, it, you know, as long as I could help the team and get on the field. So it was a new position for me. I never really played it before, but as the tournament went on, I started to adapt to it and I started to get better and better at it each game. And by the end of the tournament, you know, I was, I was really enjoying it. I thought I was playing it really well, you know, coming deep, knowing when to run in behind, run forward. And I liked always being like in the box, you know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. getting it in the box, touch, goal, like that kind of stuff I really like and I really enjoy. And even at Philly, at the Diamond, I play a higher 10. So it's kind of similar, the roles. So I thought they did a great job of identifying my strengths and knowing that and not being afraid to put me at the false nine because I am a little smaller. So Yeah, you seem to really enjoy scoring early goals too. That helps yeah, incredibly. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Uh, so excited right. you know to get on the field that the first like five minutes i was just buzzing so i was like all right let's get an early one that's actually those goals are crucial especially at the u20 level we all know you guys are young players it's 
it's easier to get a little bit more nervous, a little bit more excited uh, with everything that's happening. And getting a nerdy goal is just a major boost for young players right there. And we saw that in many games. The Costa Rica game was that early goal was vital. Uh, yeah, the way I saw sure. it, that goal. So, but in terms of that, so it was a little bit of you embracing the role and necessity that the team needed. Uh, where do you see yourself? Where do you, what is your which position and role do you see getting the best out of you? I'd say uh, still uh, the number 10 role. That's where I probably feel more comfortable. That's where I've spent most of my time at the youth levels, like developing. But again, I think it's great being able to be versatile. You know what I mean? Like playing the 10, I've played left winger at Philly. They were trying me there at US, like playing, being able to play false nine or regular nine. I think it's great. It shows you different perspectives of the game. And I think it's crucial to be versatile in this day and age. But I'd say to answer your question, 10 is my most like comfortable position. Now, the besides the congratulations to you and the entire team that I've always been saying to all the players of qualifying to the Olympics in U20, we haven't qualified the Olympics in a while. We missed the past three, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. three Olympics. Uh, I was going to now a little bit off soccer, ask you about the fight with Costa Rica. I asked this to Antonio because he got freaking hit on the back pretty so, badly. Yeah, yeah. That, Where were you like in the pictures. fight? I, I, I don't remember. Did, what, what happened there from your perspective? Because Antonio was like, we don't know. They just started getting into a brawl. There was waving, obviously, with some players, which it doesn't justify violence. Antonio yeah. got hit from the back. Uh, where were you there? What, what happened? Close I was, uh, so yeah, like the final whistle blew and like, we were obviously like so excited. So I just ran onto the field and I wanted to go congratulate, uh, Choco, uh, Cuevas Amir. And I was, he was like on the ground. So I help him up and I get him up and then I look over and I just see like, I think Antonio kind of get hit. So nobody really knew what to expect. You know, like, of course it was CONCACAF game. The emotions were really high. Nobody likes losing, you know what I mean? So I was kind of just like, everyone was kind of just like, oh my gosh. And then I kind of separated from the group with another Costa Rican and an assistant coach and Jack McGlynn. We were kind of off to the side, kind of breaking stuff up. It was it was just like a lot going on. You know what I mean? You didn't know where to go. You just wanted to break it up and make sure it all ended safely. Probably the craziest moment. I like also that you guys got the experience of playing Honduras away, right? The, Honduras, that was a full yeah. stadium. Um, but you, you all didn't really seem to feel the pressure that game, right? How was that experience of playing against a hostile fan base, packed stadium against the host nation, and cruising through? That game was, I, I, look, I don't want to say one of the easiest, but it, it looked pretty easy from a, a fan perspective. It looked pretty easy for you guys. Uh, how was that? Were you guys nervous coming into the game from the fans? What was it? Um yeah, for me personally, I loved it. Like I loved when I saw like how the groups would line up in the knockout stages. I, I wanted to play Honduras in the semifinal for the Olympics. Like knowing our history that they knocked us out the last couple of times, knowing that they're the host um, city, knowing that it's in Honduras. I I love that kind of stuff. I like embracing that. So that's who I wanted to play. And you know, you saw the crowd. It's like no other. And I love playing in that kind of atmosphere. It only builds character. But the team everyone embraced it the staff i remember before the game mikey was like i wouldn't have had it any other way playing honduras in honduras hostile environment this is exactly how we want it this is exactly how we want it to play out and i think we came out and played our best half of the entire tournament we were knocking it pressing the ball swarming them and they were a good team they were a really good mm -hmm. opponent and i just thought we executed our plan perfectly and it was it was really fun to play in yeah i was expecting a uh tougher game for sure i thought it was going to be a grind a very concacaf like game i do think the rotation and the depth that the united states had helped so much because you guys were able to rest and get through while honduras for example they had to play their best but we had so much that you were able to rest come in and vadas did a great job and you guys for sure with that let me ask you one thing here because it would be good to get your opinion because now the last time you were in the channel, correct me if I'm wrong, you still didn't have professional minutes, right? You were coming out of the academy. Yeah, no, I still didn't make my debut or anything. Yeah, so we had that. And then you had last season minutes with Philadelphia again this year. So you have professional minutes, more training sessions with professional players. Oh, not, I don't want to say professional. I want to say grown man, right? Guys yeah, that are yeah, 25, 30-year-old yeah. man that have been professional for a while and playing for the top team in the, the East right now, right, in MLS. So 
what I was going to ask you is this. One th theory that I had was that one of the reasons the United States was so ahead was almost every player in our national team there, including yourself, had professional experience playing against older men while you guys faced a lot of um, academy kids, right? So just so you know, statistic-wise, you guys had over 30,000 professional minutes coming into the tournament. The second team that had the most, I think it was Canada, and it was like 15,000. After that, it went down quite a bit. It was like yeah. below 10,000. And even so, Canada, a lot of them were in the Canadian Premier League. It's not the same level as Major League Soccer. So from these two years that you've had professional, how much have you changed? Because, and do you agree with me? Do you think that played a role now that you thought of, maybe thought about it? How much have you changed from like a, a two, roughly two years ago and now this professional environment, adult environment compared to academy? Yeah, I think it helped us tremendously getting to play in, in an environment where it's, like you said, grown men competing for jobs and playing at such a high level. Like the intensity is just so much different. The way they close the ball down, the way you have to keep the ball a certain distance away from them or you're going to get knocked off the ball. It's tighter margins when you're playing with these kind of players that are super experienced. So you have to be cleaner. You have to be thinking way ahead of the game and I think the entire team, you know, us having training in those environments for sure tremendously helped us. Like getting to play our own age is something I feel like a lot of the guys on the team haven't really done before necessarily because we've always been playing up, you know, we've always been playing with first team, training with grown men. So getting to play down our own age was definitely fun for all of us. And I'd say to answer the second question, like how I've grown being in a professional environment, just picking my speed of game up you know what i mean the pace i can't take three touches in the box you have to take two or your shots getting blocked everything you have to kind of sharpen up on like counter pressing pressing everything all that stuff you have to just sharpen in on and dial in on and you know if i take three touches in the box too many your shots getting blocked you have to be extremely clean and i think that played a huge role like you said and and not just um not just going from academy to MLS. It's also when you move to a different league, depending on what the league is. I remember, I, I think it was, it wasn't you, it was your brother. Um, when I asked him about in Europe and MLS, and then he said, one thing I noticed was time and space was more compressed here. I had to make my decisions quicker, sharper. Every time you move a level up, that's what the jump will be essentially. It's part of your development as a player. Which brings me to essentially the last section of this interview. I know for many of the viewers, it might seem like a shorter interview. But one, I don't want to take much of your time. And two, we had another interview with you. So they can go back and listen to that, listen to this and combine it. Uh, I want to ask you this. There, your name has been around a few clubs in terms of transfer. Obviously, your focus right now is breaking through Philly, becoming a starter for Philly. You keep doing getting that starting job for Philly before you, you move abroad, most likely. But in terms of transfer rumors, as much as you're allowed to talk about or talk, has there been transfers? Are you allowed to talk about any possible clubs? I said, like uh, like you said, um, my full focus is with Philly, but I mean, it's an honor. I don't really read into rumors that much, but it's always an honor being associated with these rumors like these clubs because it's every young boy's dream, especially mine, you know, growing up. One of my goals is always okay in my career if i did make it i always wanted to try and be in europe and take that next step but for now it's my full focus is with philly and i'm gonna continue to give them everything i'm gonna start a fake rumor of you going to real madrid right <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no i i actually fully agree with you there there's really uh, it's something Greg Berhalter said that it's it is true. You kill it at one level, get it done there, dominate, go to the next one, go to the next one. And I think this brings me to the final section of this talk, which is something your brother has done, right? Yeah. He performed very well in MLS. He went to Salzburg, performed very well in Salzburg. Now he went to the Premier League. So he's moving slowly, right? Rather than just going to MLS, right to the top level, struggling. No, he's going slowly and uh, we'll see how it goes with leads this season only time will tell or he has time it doesn't have to break out this whatever happens but it's been working wonderfully for him uh it's crazy how fast he improved as a player do you and brendan ever talk about that because he has that experience do you ever talk about when is the right time to move what is the right move um what because I, I haven't asked him what played a role on his decision. I don't know if it's him talking to your father, 
because I know your father does some work with you guys, right? In terms of training. Yeah. Um, do you two talk about that at all or it's not really a topic of conversation? No, we, we've talked about that. And I think uh, I admire like his career so far. Like you said, it's been like step by step, like slow, not going in and rushing anything. Like you said, he came up with Philly, you know, killed it in MLS and then made a smart move, I think, to Salzburg instead of going to maybe like a Premier League team at first. I think Salzburg was a great stepping stone from him to continue to improve at a top team. And, you know, he praises Salzburg. He always told me how much he loved it there. And now taking a step to the Premier League. And like you said, we'll see how he proves himself this year, but it's a great club. And his steps and his path is something I admire and how he didn't rush into anything. He took it step by step and each place he's went, he's kind of just kept his head down and concentrated and killed it slow by slow. And yeah, I think we talk about that and I just admire that. Yeah, I remember when I had him and you, both of you always praised a lot the Premier League. You both yeah. are big Premier League fans. And it was it was pretty fun to see that he's fulfilling his dream. Hopefully you get there too in the near future, obviously being patient and taking one step at a time. Paxton, that's mostly everything that I wanted to cover here today. Obviously, a lot of the questions we have on the other interview that people can check, that was, it would be kind of fun to rewatch it now. Yeah, uh, I, know, I might have to ago. go rewatch it. Um, but, but again, thank you very much for coming along once again. It was fun having you, and it's been fun to see you slowly mature more and more as a player. And looking forward to Philly. And unfortunately, you guys beat Orlando here this weekend when, when we're recording this. Um, but it, it, it was lots of fun. Paxton, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. It's fun as always.